Yeah. Okay, so our speaker today is Nate, and after completing his BSEE in 2011, Nathan remained in the Boston area to work in the innovation economy. After five years of industry, with work ranging from designing advanced wireless power systems to medical, automotive, and consumer applications to research and development on measurement and control systems in harsh environments, Nathan joined the Palawa Group here at the University of Illinois in 2016 for graduate studies. Current research includes high energy density converters as well as their real-time emulation, the topic of today's talk. So, good afternoon. Um, today I will indeed be talking about hardware in the loop emulation, specifically as it applies to flying capacitor multi-level converters. And um, I want to start by talking about one of the projects here at EC uh, Illinois that we're doing with NASA, which involves the investigation of future electric aircraft. Uh, key enabling technology for these aircraft are high uh, specific power and high efficiency inverter drives to power the electric machines on board. We've identified the flying capacitor multi-level topology as a promising solution um, for this future endeavor. However, uh, there is still some additional need for investigation into the low-level control of the FCML converter, specifically um, controlling the flying capacitor voltage balancing and guaranteeing that we can have stable and robust control under transient. Additionally, we also want to consider how you might control a system of systems. Um, we specifically see in order to attain the power levels required to power the electric machines on the aircraft, we may take a design approach where paralleling multiple inverter modules, multiple systems, makes the most sense. So how do we go about controlling these systems in uh, a larger scale um, to power the motors. So this leads me to an outline of today's talk. Um, I'm going to specifically discuss the motivation for using hardware in the loop as a means to assist the design um, and testing of any control strategies implemented for flying capacitor multi-level inverters as well as discuss how a model is actually developed to run in real time on one of these emulators. I'll proceed to the experimental validation of said model, exploring first DC-DC operation of the model, and then finally ending up with an actual inverter implementation. And I'll conclude with a discussion of some future work. So as I mentioned before, um, we would like to do further investigation into low-level control. Um, unfortunately, anytime you want to develop a controller for this uh, type of system, you require the physical hardware to do so. Additionally, uh, you kind of confound uh, the debugging process if you aren't 100% sure that the hardware actually works as expected. So was it a code error or was it a glitch in the signal? So we want to try and separate those two causes of error. Additionally, as we've seen at higher power or even lower power, controller bugs can lead to a destructive failure of the, the hardware under test. On a different scale, on the system of system level, uh, testing si system level control actually requires having multiple of these inverters then. So you almost have to be in production at that point in manufacturing to be able to have this system to even test on. Additionally, collaboration becomes difficult. If you have one big system, that probably took a lot of time investment to get up and running and is probably monopolized by whoever's running the test. To be able to share that uh, takes resources, and if we can figure out how to get around that bottleneck, uh, we could perhaps address some, we could perhaps facilitate better collaboration in control design. So rather than using physical hardware to test our controllers, what I'm examining is a hardware in the loop emulation uh, implementation. Basically here, you take a model, a schematic diagram of how your system should behave, all of the electrical connections. That gets compiled onto a real-time emulator, which, given gate signals by a physical controller, outputs analog feedback that the controller can then use 
um, in the system under test. So the nice thing about this, it does not require a working hardware prototype. Testing is non-destructive. The worst thing that can happen is your simulation can crash. Systems of systems are easily simulated. You can create multiple instances of a specific conver converter topology on a single emulator or parallel multiple emulators. Collaboration is a lot easier. Um, digital models are easily shared. The nice thing is this is also low voltage I.O. This can be done in the office at the desk instead of in the laboratory environment. And it should lead to faster design throughput you can compile and test your controller um, without having to go back and forth between the lab. So um, on to the model development, how we actually get from the schematic, the abstraction, into the real-time emulation. And the way that this works in the specific emulator we're using, this would be the Typhoon Hill 402. The schematic is a means of defining all the electrical connections. The software then breaks the schematic into a series of state space equations that the emulator can then quickly solve um, with a short enough latency that it would appear that you're operating real hardware in real time. Um, to begin, I'd like to Think about this state space structure, but with a very specific example. The rudimentary example in our case would be the three level flying capacitor converter. Um, I guess the, the backtrack with the state space equation, we have x being our state vector, u being our input vector, and this kind of showing the state evolution over one time step. In the three-level example, we can quickly identify what our three state variables are, the capacitor voltages and the inductor current. In addition to these three state variables, we also see that, well, in our case, the input vector is going to be the DC voltages, and then our matrices A and B are scaling as the switch state scale. And I guess what I mean by that is we have a system of equations for every switch state that exists. So uh, I'm just going to quickly go through the four switch states that you might see in normal operation and their corresponding state space representation. So for switch state one, we have 2B and uh, 1A are on. Switch state two, we have another corresponding set of equations. Switch state three, a third, switch state four. And the basic um, concept I'm trying to convey here is that we have the same state variables, but the switch configuration changes are reflected in the different definitions of the system in state, state space. So on to the actual implementation, and I think that's best conveyed with an example as well. Considering this same three-level converter, if we were looking at a change from switch state one to switch state two, and so let's say this happens at time uh, TS1 between sampling intervals on our emulator. Um, this is detected at a specific 20 nanosecond um, resolution sampling interval. The state equations then are solved for that given switch state and the given values of the state variables. And after computations on the processor and additional compensation, a result reflected at the output of the converter is shown with a latency of two to three simulation time steps later. Um, so that's essentially how the, the model was developed and implemented for all of the flying level converters. I guess the one other thing I wanted to mention with that is the state variable scale with the number of flying capacitors we have and the different systems, the number of uh, independent systems that could be solved scale with the number of switches. So having developed this model, um, the model's only going to be as good as it is accurate. So we wanted to compare the fidelity, to quantify the fidelity of the model, based on observing the actual experimental system uh, in tandem with the simulation. So the way we progressed through this experimental analysis was to first consider the converter as just a DC-DC converter where we're not perturbing the, the, the duty cycle. 
so that if there are any errors that are coming up in the simulation, we might uh, more easily track down what the source might be. And then move on to inverter operation, examining transient stability um, along the way. Prior work with uh, real-time simulators has shown that the best way to validate model fidelity is by using a single controller and sending the exact same control signals to both the emulator and a hardware implementation in real time, then comparing the resultant waveforms. As I mentioned, we use the Typhoon Hill 402 emulator as our hardware in the loop emulator. And for our physical hardware, we use a 13-level flying capacitor uh, testbed that was developed in prior work uh, as cited. At the time of writing, we could simulate up to seven level converters. So we collected data for three, five, and seven level converters and were able to adapt the test bed for each experiment uh, based on which type of converter we were emulating. Um, additionally, while there are plenty different points that we could collect data and take measurements, the inductor current and the unfiltered voltage at the output of the converter, so what I label VX, were chosen as the two key uh, waveforms of interest because the IL captures the sum of all the currents and VX captures all of the capacitor voltages during interleaved operation. Yeah, this is just a, a picture of the lab setup where we're showing the experimental controller um, connected to both the test bed and the emulator waveforms were collected on the scopes and the software running the emulator uh, was also present. So for DC-DC steady state, um, the test conditions are as listed and because performance might vary depending on the given duty cycle, we swept duty ratios from basically zero to one uh, percent actually enumerated there and recorded data on simulated and experimental waveforms throughout the entire process. This was done for three, five, and seven level topologies and represented a lot of data, um, one plot of which I show here. Now also typical of prior work is a qualitative anal uh, analysis. You can look at these waveforms and see that, yes, it does seem that there is pretty good representation um, the, from the emulator of what the experiment should be doing. However, there's a ton of data to look at um, across quite a few operating regimes. So uh, the qualitative analysis, looking at each waveform individually, isn't a really good measure of model fidelity. So we went on to develop some more quantitative metrics, the first of which is actually considering some statistical analysis on the pulse width of our VX as described. So the VX again is what I'm saying is the interleaved voltage waveform. Right. Um, and we chose that not only because it embodies the different capacitor voltages, but it also has the most strict timing constraints. This not only is going to be the, the narrowest pulse width we seem, it's also going to be the highest frequency pulse width. So I demonstrate how, given the two switch signals, one and two A, you're all familiar with this, how we generate a pulse at the VX node with any, uh, up to a very small pulse width, I should say. This sensitivity towards the VX pulse width is represented in the experimental data. Here I have shown plot the measured pulse widths in terms of an effective duty ratio on this VX node of both the experimental hardware and the Hill simulation. And the big takeaway from these set of plots for the three, five, and seven level are that the experimental hardware does not really have any pulse width jitter. Uh, the standard deviation for all of those was near zero. It's a very precise signal. However, the hill pulse width does have quite a bit of jitter 
um, across all of the switching cell duty ratios. And this actually appeared to be a very good metric for qualifying performance, um, where we see the three and five level have a relatively small, perhaps acceptable, uh, standard deviation in pulse width jitter. Once we start getting the seven level, which is going to have the highest frequency um, pulse pulses on VX, um, given a fixed timing precision, this is going to be a relatively larger amount of error for the seven level. So the, the fact that the standard deviation is much higher for the standard deviation and error is much higher for the seven level does make sense, but it does start calling into question how well the model behaves for the seven level converter. Cross correlation was also considered as a metric. One of the motivations behind using this was that it, it, it considers the entire waveform um, in the calculation. And so I show that we use a normalized cross correlation that is the cross correlation of the simulated and experimental waveforms normalized to the autocorrelation of each so that at peak cross correlation, we would have a maximum of one if the signals were identical. So a value closest to unity is a good indicator that the model has high fidelity. Again, plotted for the three, five, and seven level converter across varied duty ratio, we see that the three and five level mostly have a pretty good correlation score. Um, seven level, again, has diminishing performance, though it's not that bad, except all of them have the same common, uh, let's say, lowest scores at switching cell duty ratios that are an integer multiple of the phase shift of the converter. And to kind of sum up why that is, I mean, we're noticing that the worst case performance is when VX is at a minimum pulse width. But to elaborate on that, if we go back to the individual switching signals, again for the three level, we can see that in the emulator implementation, we can still detect the first gate signal change at very high resolution. However, the emulator is only set to accept one change per time step. So if we're operating at a duty cycle close to the phase shift, another gate signal change may occur and not be resolved until the next time step, adding to the error in our timing accuracy. The last metric, um, or rather comparison technique explored, was more in the frequency domain. And this involved taking the FFT of both the experimental and simulated waveforms and calculating a comparison in spectral power of the two. And in this case, as the hardware, uh, the experimental waveforms were like the known true value, they were used as the reference in this plot. So the big takeaway from this is that for the most part, the spectral content looks um, The spectral content is uh, in agreement between both the emulator and the experimental results, except in cases where we see oscillations um, that occur whenever the duty cycle is again creating pulse widths at this extreme of the timing resolution. And in fact, some investigation has led to uh, the conclusion that these oscillations are actually limit cycles occurring, and they are at the switching frequency of the output filter. Um, but this oscillation does not occur in the experimental waveforms, so it's definitely an artifact of the simulation and worth exploring in future work. So having considered the steady state analysis, it was also relevant to consider how well the simulator performs under transient. And one of the easiest transients to induce was the step in duty cycle. So shown here is 
a step from 37% to 62% duty cycle on the three-level converter. And it's interesting to not only see how good the model emulates the peak and settling time for the inductor current on uh, the longer time scale, but also how well the current is followed even uh, in the shorter time scale and the individual switching periods. And indeed, more impressive than what the current is doing, we can also see that the voltage imbalance caused by this transient is also very well represented by the simulation um, just shown by the plot in the qualitative analysis. But having established cross-correlation as a plausible metric for quantitative analysis, we also list those metrics here, and we can see that both the IL and VX have very good scores. Now, we also tested the seven level. It did not perform as well for the uh, faster switching uh, fidelity, but we were able to still see the same peak and settling time fidelity on IL, which does seem to indicate that it could still have merits um, for use in system level simulation. So having analyzed where sources of error might be under DC-DC operation, we then considered the emulator simulating an inverter, uh, an inverter scenario. So we modulate the duty cycle at 400 hertz, here actually at slightly higher power, and in addition to uh, testing at the specified frequency for the seven level converter, we also wanted to really push the limits of the emulator. So we increased the switching frequency um, to 49 kilohertz and 98 kilohertz, showing respective increases in the output frequency and the the correlation metrics are again plotted here. Um, again, they are very high, and that shows some very promising results for even a simulation running at an uh, effective 588 kilohertz. That said, if you actually look at the plots, um, we do see some emulation fidelity just visually uh, decreasing as we really push this interleave frequency. So. While you still see a very good sinusoid in all three plots at each of the uh, faster and faster switching frequencies, we again start seeing what appears to be the uh, same problem with the DC-DC converter, some oscillations occurring again at what appears to be the output filter frequency. Um, so this leads to, to two conclusions. One, that we can still perhaps get very good system level emulation, um, but also we will need to put additional work into really uh, battening down these limit cycle oscillations to further uh, progress the emulator. The last experiment involved taking a load step, uh, and in this case I showed the load step with the five level inverter, the load step effectively halves uh, the load that the inductor was, uh, that the converter was seeing at a time step zero. And from this plot, we can see both that the current waveform is tracked very well. The simulator tracks the experiment very well um, just after the transient. Uh, however, there is a decent amount of steady state error when we subtract the time aligned simulated waveform from the experimental waveform. And again, frequency analysis of this error shows that these oscillations are again at that same limit cycle observed everywhere else in, in the other experiments. Um, still very good cross correlation metrics. So in conclusion, um, three, five, and seven level real-time emulation models were developed. They were tested on the very fast 500 nanosecond time step capable Typhoon Hill 402. These models were compared against a hardware analog on a 13 level test bed. And throughout this process,
several metrics were proposed to compare the two. That would be the statistics on the pulse width, cross-correlation, and spectral power comparison. Model fidelity was demonstrated, but within certain limits. There are clearly applications where we can see low-level control could be tested on this, and plenty more applications where only a system-level type of emulation is possible. And for future work, we, as, as mentioned, would really like to discern what's causing these oscillations and how we might be able to mitigate those either in a control strategy or uh, perhaps a better emulator implementation and further refine comparison metrics so we can perhaps have metrics that are more reflective of the distortions we saw in the inverter uh, towards the end there. So there's some acknowledgments. This was supported, this project was supported by uh, NASA and POETS here at UIUC. And I'd also like to thank our collaborators at Typhoon Hill in Boston. That concludes my talk. I appreciate your uh, patience, and I'm happy to take questions at this time. Yeah. Yes, the uh, why, did you pick up why those are so high given that mess? I have a feeling it's because the amplitude at the fundamental at 400 hertz is so much higher. This is actually a case, so the correlation was chosen because it had very good application in the DC-DC case. Um, and we wanted to try and bring that metric along uh, in, in this comparison as well. What might make a lot more sense here is to do a THD reference from the experimental hardware and see how much it, the simulation deviates. Yes? The simulation can sample uh, with 20 nanosecond precision. So that's whenever it can detect, it'll detect the gate change, uh, a gate signal change within 20 nanoseconds of it happening. The time step is 500 nanoseconds. But it can only, it can only detect the first change. So that's where a lot of the, the problems we see happening can arise. How do you mean? You would be talking about like looking at uh, like a, a byte representation instead of like individual pulses or? Right now we are looking at six, you know, channels. Yes. Yes. Yes, I see what you mean. You could probably do that. That would um, reduce some of the flexibility in what you're doing with the emulator. The idea is that you don't really know what your controller is doing a priori. So you would ideally like to be able to just get an arbitrary gate signal, just as you would, because you wouldn't be doing that on your actual hardware. The point is to be able to test your converter as if it were real hardware. Yes. Yeah, assuming you can get this capacitor off the ground, how confident are you you can get it back? The um, the the plane. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't think that uh, we've fit all of that into the emulator model just yet. The the avionics is a whole other beast. <laughs> Yes. Uh, can I test the startup? Startup. Uh, yes, that's an interesting question. You should be able to, though, 
everything done here was, was in steady state. Um, you can define the initial conditions, um, so how everything starts, and, and nothing will change in the emulator until it starts receiving gate signals. So, so yes, you should be able to. Mm -hmm. um, when you run the simulation, uh, so you have one controller and then send signals to, yes. to both hardware and the uh, yes. It's not closed loop, no. Um, so this was just to demonstrate. You could, you could potentially, let's say, give both of them the same gate signals just independently. So you know your converter is always going to be outputting the same stream of pulses, collect some data on the hill, collect some data on the experimental hardware. But this is really. Um, just as it means running them both at the same time, so you can get the exact same inputs for the exact same, the exact same outputs for the exact same inputs. But you can use it to run some you, you would, yes. Yeah. So, so the way the way it actually works, so the I showed on the the previous page here, a couple back, uh, the emulator outputs the analog signals. So the whole point is that. you can use it as a means to develop uh, closed loop control. So even though this was all just given gate signals free running, yes? Yes, yes, so um, let's say in, in this model or, what was that? Uh, no, any change on the digital inputs. So I, I guess to clarify, the the PWM signals sent from the controllers are sent to specific digital input blocks on the emulator, and all of those are read. Um, basically, they're updated at the 20 nanosecond uh, rate, and whichever one happens to change first, that's the one that's detected at that resolution. But it won't be until the next time step that either all of them are read at once or another one can be read at that resolution, so. How many flying cap inverters do take seven level to stay in uh, it, appears, it appears only one, and actually, there is a caveat to the seven level model. Um, because the number of system scales with the number of switches, it became a very big model even just to get running on the emulator, so we had to do, a, I had to do a trade-off in this where, the seven level simulation, and that's actually one of the reasons why the uh, fidelity might not be so great, is it doesn't have any flying capacitors. They're approximated with ideal voltage sources because it, the current uh, at writing, the current capability could not support that many state variables. Um, that said, I think the model can be optimized. I think you know this type of thing is used in power systems where it's emulating a three phase uh, system. And I think there are additional cores that are prioritized in that way, so it could probably be optimized to, to fit it. But, um, but I think, like, let's say you want to do three phases, I think it would be as simple as implementing the same model on a different core. There are, yeah, there are three, I think, equivalently sized cores, and this fills up one of them, the seven level does. All right, well, if there are no further questions, thanks again. <laughs>